Today we're at the fire station. And we're gonna check out the fire museum. Uh huh. So go ahead and put your thumb. Mm -hmm. It's right, palm of your hand right in the middle of the chest. Yeah, right there. Put your other hand on top. Okay, bend forward a little bit toward me. So your shoulder above your elbow, above your wrist. So come over and your wrist is right above the heart. Yeah. Right there. Oh, there good. you go. Yeah. Oh. Good. Okay. Perfect. So your depth has to be at least two inches. This is good recoil. Okay, push deep. Compress deep. Deep. Push. Yeah, push. Good, good. Now bring this up to 100. It's like a video game. Go, go, right there, right there. Perfect, right there is perfect. If you stay at 110, it is even better. Right, okay, so on a tad bit. Keep going, keep going. Is that rhythm? Is that rhythm? I know, what is it? I don't know, they thought it was like a song. Okay, so keep going. Oh, there you go. There. Hey, who's that beat? <laughs> Kids, look at me, kids. Let's dance. Let's dance, kids. Gracie, Gracie. Show me your moves. Floyd, show me your moves. Gracie, show me your moves. This is for your video. Here you go. Floyd, show me your moves. So does that mean I got a slower? No, that means you have to let the top end come off. There's a little bit of pressure on the chest. Oh, that's like one of the other Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's getting tired though. Yeah. Okay, elbows. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Right there. Perfect. Keep that right. Alright! Dude, that is doing good! <laughs> you guys want to try metal? Yeah, you yeah, go. Okay, and push them. Yeah, that's it! Good! <laughs> <laughs> Come back to Mark, yeah! Nice! Good job, girls. Woohoo! Yeah, that's cool! <laughs> Nice. Go ahead. Woohoo! It's doing CPR. It's hard to do. Wait, here, are you guys still bracelet? Gracie, what do you say? CPR saves lives. Gracie, did you say thank you? Do we start over here? Closer, don't worry, I'm not gonna bite you guys. Close. Close. What is your name? Gracie. Gracie. And how old are you? Five. Five. And what is your name, sir? Julian. What's that? Julian. Julian? And how, how old is your brother? Um, almost two. Is this your brother too? Who's this guy? That's my dad. Hi, oh, your dad. <laughs> okay, good guys. Ponuakaha. <laughs> That's the name of this area before. This is a hospital. Which is good because when you go to the hospital, do they help you? They make you feel better? So as firefighters, the people are sick, they call 911 and they try to come out and they try to help you. So that's why it's kind of a good thing that we remember that we're here to help people, right? And then back in. I got the I got the thing. <laughs> That happened, a lot of firefighters had to go to that and had to climb up the stairs to go help people. And then a building came down. And then that's a piece of the building right there. So they cut up the pieces and then they sent it out to over 2,000 different organizations that want to make a memorial. So that piece actually came from New York. So we put it there. Always to remind us, this is the old station line. What number? <laughs> what number? Station. What number is this? Station nine. started 
by King Kamehameha III, this picture right here. His name was Kaui Keoli, and he thought it was very important to have a fire department, some, a group of people to help put out fires in case of emergency. So he wrote an ordinance, and it was published in the Polynesian newspaper on January 11, 1851, making it official that we were established. Um, also, that makes us the oldest department west of the Mississippi. To help the king um, develop the department and make sure we're all set to run smoothly, we had some help from firefighters from the East Coast, such as Boyd and Park and Alexander Cartwright. And then through the years, as the leadership of the kingdom had changed, um, they were given a scene to help put out fires. Some of the royalty actually would roll up their sleeves and help pass the bucket. Long time ago, they didn't have fire trucks yet, and so they made a requirement that every house and every business had to have two buckets of water ready just in case. And so in that emergency, they actually were known to come outside and help be part of that for me. Um, we have this picture here of Prince Albert. He's just a small little guy like some of you because he was fascinated by the fire department. He was the son of Kamehameha IV, Queen Emma, and some people say he may have wanted to be a firefighter more than the, the next in line to be king. So he was made an honorary firefighter with his own little red uniform. Feel free to take a look, and then we're gonna make our way towards the middle and show you how some of our there were some horses that were used to help pull the wagon and then technology got better and better and so we got to progress to bigger vehicles like this and even bigger ones like the ones you have today. What color are these fire trucks? What color is this? Fire station. And then the bell would ring so that they knew how, uh, so that they could know what numbers belong to the street of that box. Then they'd walk over here to their fire cabinet and they'd look for those numbers. And so the numbers that match to that box, 5635, that would actually take us to Pamoa Street End. And it would tell the fire company where they needed to go, who was gonna go first, who was gonna go second. And um, again, technology continued to progress eventually, so we had a ticker tape system where it would actually punch out the information, what do we call? That's right, 911, in case of an emergency. So there was one emergency that was really, really big a long time ago, and Firefighter Mao is gonna share that story with you. So you guys can come close and listen to that story. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, yeah. Good morning, everyone over here. I see a hole near the gas pedal. That's uh, actually a bomb shrapnel damage from that day on December 7, 1941 there. Yeah. So all the other damage was repaired because it's still a brand new truck back then. So it did see a lot of service even after the war. Yeah. Okay, so you can continue down here. You can both take pictures too. <laughs> okay, so come all the way down to our Hickam Field area here. Down at Hickam Field. Okay. So they would have pulled all the way up to the Hickam Fire Department here. And the whole Hickam Fire Department was kind of bombed out. So there was no one to give them orders that day. So they became the firefighting force. 23 firefighters. Of um, Honolulu Fire Department became the entire firefighting force for that day. And they stretched out hose lines and positioned their trucks because they tried to protect the planes and the hangars that they realized might be needed for the counter attack against um, the enemy forces. But before they could begin firefighting operations, they realized oh, we have no water. All the hydrants had been bombed out too. So these are technique called drafting and they stretch that big black hole that you saw in the back of the truck down into the bomb crater that was filling up with water and that's how they got their water supply for that day so but before they could begin firefighting operations again the next wave of japanese fighters came in and bombers so they had to duck and cover and hit for 15 minutes endure the bullets and bombs and when the smoke cleared Nine of our firefighters were the wounded, killed. Captain John Carrera of Engine One, Captain Thomas Macy of Engine 
four and Harry Tuckley Pang, postman of Engine Six, uh, passed away and six others were wounded. They were all around this hangar area, you can see. Yeah. So what it may have looked like back then, on that day, a little history of the Purple Heart also. So Honolulu Fire Department is the only civilian fire department in the nation that have ever been awarded the Purple Heart. We received nine of those um, Purple Hearts that day for our members who were killed or wounded on that day. And nowadays only military members who were killed or wounded in action can receive it. So we're very proud to have that particular dis distinction and award. Okay. okay, so you make your way down over here to this picture. Okay, so this last picture, Honolulu City. If you look at all of the little red circles over here, this was um, all of the incidents that Honolulu Fire Department responded to in the downtown and Macaulay areas. So all of the munitions that was being fired at, up at the Japanese, the Japanese were flying so low to the ground. So a lot of artillery fire went right back at them, which is meant to explode at altitude, it had to land somewhere. So since it missed the planes, it ended up landing in the civilian population here in Honolulu. So you'll see a lot of the damage in these pictures. They responded to over 39 calls that day. So every single one of those alarm boxes that, um, that you saw up on the wall there earlier was being pulled. So Chief Blazel at the time said, we're only gonna respond to the incidents where we can get an address via a phone. So busiest day of our um, department. Yeah. Okay, so our next area down here, before we make our way up, I know you folks have probably saw the, uh, the brass pole right, right here, right here, yeah? Okay, so this pole, as you, everyone knows, goes upstairs, right? So every two-story fire station on the island has a pole like this. That's because the fire trucks are on the bottom floor and the area of bedrooms is upstairs, yeah? So if you have a fire at nighttime, you can slide down, jump out of our bed, slide down the pole, and um, go right to the truck. But nowadays, all of our fire stations are one story. That's because a lot of firefighters are getting hurt coming down from this pole. <laughs> because as you can imagine, nighttime when you're coming down, and the only time I would come down the pole nighttime um, when I was at Macaulay for a year and a half, was if I was stuck in the shower or stuck on the toilet. So I'd come back, that's because I didn't want to miss the truck. If you miss the fire truck, you have to buy a nine course Chinese dinner for everyone. So I would come down this pole soaking wet, covered in suds, and when you get this pole wet, how, how, you, how, you, how am I going to come down? Really fast. So you fly down really fast, hit the ground hard, or you stick and you skip all the way down. And that kind of hurts. You don't have to do that either. So nowadays, we always come down the stairs and we try and put all of our fire stations one story. Even on the mainland, they have slides now. So they don't want to have people coming down the poles because too many firefighters are getting hurt coming down this pole. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a little history. And when we go upstairs now, we're gonna see our dormitory area, so we'll go this way. Through. You're right, good job. <laughs> How many adults cook over here? Not me. Raise your hands. <laughs> How many of you guys only cook in the drive through <laughs> Okay, so, for people that cook, when we go out and we talk to groups, talk to classes, businesses, we always gotta talk about fire safety. So when you get called on fire department for building fires, structure fires, the main cause is usually cooking related. Yeah? Cooking related usually is the, the, the reason why you're building fires or uh, in a like that. Like frying something. And I give the example, we all like to make chicken cots in the fire station. Because everybody likes chicken cots. Easy. Right? <laughs> Put flour, eggs, popcorn, get the oil going. Get the oil catch on fire. What do you think you should do? Not water. Not water. water. Cover. Cover. Only correction for that is you like this. <laughs> so what do you guys, what do, you guys do? Can I borrow a pot with a cover? Is there a pot with a cover I can borrow? It's in the ice box. Okay. There we go. I have to show your parents how to put on oil fire. So always put the lid on the side before you cook. If it starts going, you slide away and then turn off the heat. 
Don't go like this. The fire will come up and still burn you, yeah? So slide away and turn it off. So sometimes you see and you hear that alarm, building fire, you just jump out of bed, and you put on a uniform, and you go to the fire. Who wants to try to put on a uniform? Anybody want to try? You want to try? No? Let me see. I'm not going to force if you want to try. Okay, come. Let me see. What size are your feet? 11. Okay, let me see. Who else wants to try? Anybody else? No? Okay, you go first then. Here you go. You see how we have our boots and our pants? Every firefighter makes his boots and pants like this by the fire engine. So you run down to the truck, you put your feet inside, and then hold your hand. Okay, go. Put it inside. Reach down, pull up your pants. See, look at that. Oh, you're ready to go. Put this. Uh, parents, if you guys always need to work, get set up like this in the morning. Okay. Life hat. Okay, what are, are we ready to go? What else you need to fight the fire? Watch your arms, like protect your arms. Put on your Okay. You gotta protect your arms. Okay. Make sure. We'll just put the velcro for now. Okay. So right here, you put your thumb to this hole like that. Perfect. You've done this before. Is she ready now? Are you ready now? What else you need to protect? Yeah. Yes, good. You want the red hardworking one or you want the black boss one? I don't know what Which one do you like? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's I working. Know the red because that's her favorite color. Good job. Oh, good. Okay, are she ready now? She needs tools. Okay. So usually this goes together like this. We call it irons. So in the fire in the fire truck, you have the axe and the pry bar. I can get into anybody's house, no problem. So here you go. And you get this. Now you're ready to go help somebody. Wait, there we go. Yay! Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. You look like Thor. <laughs> Yeah, I do this in a way too. 